Israel Finkelstein is a leading figure in the archaeology and history of ancient Israel. Over 40 years of fieldwork and research, he has helped to change the way archaeology is conducted, the Bible is interpreted, and the history of Israel is reconstructed. I sat down with Israel over several sessions to talk about how a lifetime of work has informed the story of ancient Israel. Israel, welcome back for another conversation. Good to be here. Uh, in the last conversation, you suggested that the, the great united monarchy is an ideological manifesto rather than historical reality. We're going to get back to that, but today I want to look a little bit more closely at the figure of Saul because he gets kind of falls between the cracks. And you have already in print said a number of things about Saul and connected him or at least the concept of him to archaeological remains. But Saul is a peculiar character in that he doesn't seem to fit into the rest of the story. He is uh, a northerner, right? Uh, so you don't exactly see him connected strongly to Jerusalem. Um, why don't we start looking at Saul from the point of view of chronology and then go from there. Saul uh, is indeed a peculiar uh, figure in the biblical text because he does not rule uh, neither from Shechem nor from Jerusalem, the two um, administrative centers in the highlands of old. Mm -hmm. He rules from uh, the highlands a little bit to the north of uh, Jerusalem. He's a northern. He comes from the tribe of Benjamin, that is to say from the house of Joseph. And then there is the question, of course, of chronology. The Bible says that there were three kings in the beginning, Saul, David, and Solomon. However, there is some sort of an overlap between Saul and David. The Bible has this idea that David, this is the theology of the authors, the later authors, that David replaced Saul and that this was the wish of the God of Israel because Saul failed as the first choice to be the king of Israel and replaced them by uh, the God of Israel with David. Now, regarding chronology, the Bible uh, says the following, that David ruled for 40 years, Solomon for 40 years, and Saul, the verse is confused. Scholars usually assumed 20 years, so one gets about a century. Yet, the 40 years of David and the 40 years of Solomon are typological numbers. When sure. you have in the Bible 40 years, the meaning is many years. Not more. Many years can be 15, can be 20, can be, you know, 25, but not necessarily 40. So we don't really know exactly the inner chronology within the 10th century. We can only say that Saul ruled uh, if, uh, in the 10th century BC. Then there is another problem. Saul is understood by us as a single monarch. However, there are clues in the Bible that there was a dynasty there. Because when Saul dies, his son uh, Ishbal uh, takes the throne. So there were at least two kings in this dynasty. Maybe more, but at least two. Mm -hmm. Saul and Ishbal. And we have to take this into consideration. All right, if we're going to take a stab at this murky figure, what are the sources we're going to use? Sources, as, as usual, Biblical text, of course, mm. is important. Archaeology, whether we can find archaeology for King Saul, we'll see. And uh, in this case, there is surprisingly, possibly, one extra biblical text, biblical source, that may illuminate uh, the period of King Saul. And I refer to the uh, evidence uh, from Egypt on the campaign of uh, Pharaoh Sheshong I to Canaan uh, in the 10th century BC. This is the biblical Shishak. All right, let's start with the biblical text on Saul. The biblical text on Saul is uh, complicated, how to say, very complicated, because we basically hear two voices in the story. Uh, they can be identified and perhaps even separated. There is the positive voice speaking about Saul as a savior of the people of Israel mm -hmm. against the Ammonites, against the Philistines. He was the first king of Israel, chosen by the God of Israel. And then there is a negative uh, voice speaking about Saul as a sinner, as a, a king who did not fulfill the great hopes 
of the God of Israel in the monarchy. So uh, dealing with the biblical material on King Saul, one must first of all make this uh, distinction between the uh, two texts. So these positive and negative um, images of Saul, can you place them in time and space? Yes, indeed. The positive text on uh, Saul can be uh, looked at as some sort of an original tradition which uh, uh, was worked uh, in later periods by another author. What do I mean? I mean that the positive tradition looks to me like one coming from the north. Saul is a northern figure. Mm -hmm. Saul is described as the first king of Israel, but he is also the first king of northern Israel, of what is becoming sh soon the kingdom of Israel. Mm -hmm. So there is this positive tradition uh, of him, which could have been celebrated in the northern kingdom. And then there is another voice coming later, possibly originating from Judah, to differ from the northern voice, and uh, looking at the figure of Saul uh, in a negative way in order to justify his replacement with King David according to the biblical ideology and theology about the dynasty of uh, the Davidites in Jerusalem. So we want to start then with the positive things uh, from the north. Can you tease out some of these original traditions? Yes, I can give a few examples. The first example I should say is the search uh, of Saul for the assets of his father in the territory of the tribe of Ephraim to the north of his own place. He is from uh, the town of Geba or Gibeon, a little bit to the north of Jerusalem. Then um, there is uh, the story of his coronation. There are several stories there. One, the older one, I think, is his coronation in an unknown place by an unknown, not named, man of God. Then there is the rescue of uh, Jabesh Gilead, east of the Jordan, uh, by Saul. So Saul goes to rescue Israelites who live east of the Jordan River. He is from the west of the Jordan River, so he campaigns to the east. Then there is this tradition of the battle that uh, takes place not far from uh, his hometown against the Philistines with a very well-known description, geographical description of Geba and Michmash uh, in the biblical text. Then there is also the northern tradition about the death of uh, King Saul in the Battle of Gilboa uh, in the north. So all this package, I suppose, belongs to the positive soul, a tradition that comes from the north, from uh, uh, the northern kingdom of Israel. And it, it seems that you're kind of painting a geographical picture with those stories. What is the geography? So the geography is indeed uh, a major question because Saul rules from a small town to the north of Jerusalem. However, there are clues in the text for a bigger territory. Uh, in fact, there is maybe reason to suggest at least, we are in a situation of uh, you know, speculation in a way, but there is a reason to speculate that Saul is a figure who managed to rule over much of the territory of the highlands in the sense not very dissimilar from what we hear in the Amarna period, let's say about the ruler of Shechem, Labayo. We spoke about it in one of our previous uh, conversations. Why am I saying this? Because uh, there is evidence for him controlling not only territory to the west of the Jordan River, but also a little bit to the east in the Gilead. Secondly, there is the tradition of the Gilboa. What does he do there in the Gilboa on the margin of the Jezreel Valley? So he must have ruled according to the biblical tradition at least, all the way north uh, uh, to the Jezreel Valley, which means the territory of core Israel, of the house of Joseph, Benjamin, Ephraim, and Manasseh. And even more than that, in the cycle, the early cycle of David, there is, a, and this early cycle of David is possibly the oldest in the memories of David, there is a memory of King Saul active in the territory of the Judite Judean highlands to the south of Jerusalem. 
He goes to the valley of Elah to fight uh, the Philistines and Goliath. He goes to Adulam, which is in the Shephelah, not so far. He goes to the southern fringe of Judah, uh, on the desert fringe, even south of Hebron, farther to the south. So, so we need to raise the question here. Taking all these traditions together, whether we have here a situation of a ruler in the highlands in the 10th century who for a while managed to unite the territory under one administration, early administration, territorial entity that uh, tried also to expand to the lowlands. And trying to expand to the lowlands may illuminate what happened next. So looking at these positive traditions, you've been able to paint a, a, a picture and a geography of a kingdom of Saul. The question, as always, is, is this historical? And if it is or isn't, what are we going to use to get at it? Is Saul historical is more difficult than uh, some other questions that we posed before. Because uh, so far we spoke mainly about the biblical tradition. Uh, I think in order to verify whether this is historical, or better said, whether there is an historical core behind this description, is to turn from the Bible, as usual, to extra-biblical texts and archaeology. And in this case, we have one extra-biblical text. That is the list of Sheshonk I and his campaign into the region. Right. This is uh, complicated for many reasons. The Bible says the following. The Bible says, the Pharaoh Sheshonk, Shishak, the Bible says, who is Sheshonk the first, the founder of the 22nd dynasty in Egypt, came to the land of Israel in the fifth year of Rehoboam, the first monarch of the southern kingdom after the split, after the days of King Solomon, which puts the campaign, according to the biblical chronology, sometimes around 925 BC. The problem is that we don't know exactly from the point of view of Sheshonk because there is a big dispute uh, among Egyptologists regarding the exact dates of Sheshonk. Well, you are not going to take him to the 11th century or to the 9th century, but within the 10th century BC, there is some sort of maneuverability between, let's say, 960 and 920 BC also, we don't know when exactly during his reign the campaign took place, and we don't even know whether there was one campaign. Uh, what we can say is that there was this revival sentiment in Egypt in the days of the 22nd dynasty, and that this campaign was not just a raid. You know, it was a well-planned campaign uh, with the goal of re-establishing the Egyptian empire in the Levant in the 10th century BC. This is strategy. Now we can go to tactics and look at the details. Right. The biblical text talks about this campaign of Shishak, who is Sheshank I. The details are not in the Bible. The details are in Egypt. The details are in Egypt, and the details come from mainly uh, one source. This is uh, a relief on uh, one of the walls of the Temple of Amun, at Karnak in Upper Egypt, which uh, uh, gives us a list of places which uh, were conquered, taken over during this uh, Sheshong campaign in Canaan. Many of the places in the list can be identified. And once identified and put on the map, they reveal the tactics of the campaign. What was really the goal of Sheshong in Canaan in the 10th century BC. So we see a group of sites in the south. There is some sort of interest in the south. We will speak about it in one of our future talks. Then there is a group of sites in the Jezreel Valley, among them Megiddo. And then uh, the most peculiar group of sites are in the highlands north of Jerusalem and in, in Transjordan. So in the highlands north of Jerusalem, the text speaks about Beth Horon and also about Gibeon. And then there are several places in Transjordan, 
uh, east of the Jordan River. This is interesting because these places are not very important, you know, in the history of the land of Israel from the point of view of the neighboring empires. The neighboring empires, they were interested in the uh, main highway leading to the north with the Jezreel Valley, you know, uh, uh, things like this. But why to take the Egyptian army and march into the highlands where you risk, you know, a formation of a well-organized army like uh, the e Egyptian forces. So there must have been something there which annoyed the pharaoh. And that something could have been a territorial formation which grew in the highlands in the 10th century BC and which posed a threat to the goals of the pharaoh to re-establish uh, his uh, rule, Egyptian rule, over the territory of uh, Canaan, uh, land of Israel, if you wish. So this makes the connection because the places north of Jerusalem, Jerusalem, by the way, is not mentioned. Right. And we should get back to this in the future. But the places north of Jerusalem, which are mentioned, and the places east of the Jordan River, are exactly the places which are referred to also in the Bible in relation to the rule of King Saul. So there is here some sort of a connection geographical, first of all, and secondly, chronological. Same regions in the same period in the 10th century BC, as long as we understand that placing the Shisha campaign in the Bible in the fifth year of, of Rehoboam uh, is a true memory, but uh, could be the, the very placing the fifth year of Rehoboam could be uh, uh, influenced by theological concerns of the later authors. The Egyptian Empire is feeling threatened by something in the highlands and as a response sends the Egyptian army into the mountains, which seems a little bit ridiculous. What could this threat be and what could, what could this entity be doing that would be such a threat? In order to understand, we need again to deploy the idea of the long durée, of the long term. Let's look again at Amarna period in the 14th century BC. We have this situation of Labayo, king of Shechem. He is also an annoyance to the Egyptians at that time, in the 14th century BC, in the time of the new kingdom, the great empire. Why is that? Because he tries to expand. He feels that there is some sort of weakening of Egyptian administration, and he tries to expand, according to the Amarna letters, to the Jezreel Valley, to the coastal plain, and as long as he was sitting there at Shechem, there is no risk to the Egyptian goals, but when he starts expanding, he needs to be handled uh, by the Egyptians. Now I go back to Seoul. I think that we have a similar situation here, because I'm always looking at the long durée, the long term, and uh, I mean, especially before the rise of the territorial kingdoms of Israel and Judah. So we have here a similar situation, in my opinion, of a local ruler in the highlands who exploits a situation in the 10th century. He expands his territory to much of the highlands, even south of Jerusalem. Jerusalem itself is a problem, but let's not go into details here. And then he probably also tries to expand farther this is the way to understand his involvement in the Battle of Gilboa on the margin of the Jezreel Valley. And also the Battle of uh, the Valley of Elah, where uh, David faces uh, Goliath. What does Saul do in the Valley of Elah, which is in the lowlands, not far from the major hi highway leading to the north? So he could have misunderstood the situation, in a sense try to expand to the lowlands, and this is the moment when his goals clashed with the goals of the Egyptian pharaoh. What you describe is the expansion of a new kingdom under a ruler in the northern part of the highlands who starts to expand into the lowlands, and the Egyptian army comes in and takes him out. That should leave some traces archaeologically, I would think. Right, so this is the moment to turn to archaeology and, say, and see whether archaeology can support this uh, 
sort of speculation, you know, about uh, uh, the 10th century in the highlands. And I think that the answer is positive. Archaeology has the power here too to uh, tell us a lot um, uh, about what really happened. First, I should uh, say that archaeology reveals something very interesting in the highlands to the north of Jerusalem in the 10th century, very unique. And this is a concentration of fortified sites. Casement walls, fortified uh, situation, settlements. Now, please note that uh, there are almost no fortifications uh, in the southern Levant in the 10th century BC, except for two concentrations mainly. One in a small area to the north of Jerusalem, around Gibeon, exactly the place where we have the tradition of King Saul, exactly in the same period of time in the 10th century. The other concentration is east of the Ch Jordan in Moab. Let's leave this uh, aside. So we have this uh, system of fortified settlements, including Gibeon, which is considered by some um, scholars as the location uh, of the hub of King Saul. And these places prosper in the 10th century, according to the pottery assemblages found in them. And there is also evidence for their decline uh, in the second half of the 10th century. So prosperity, fortifications, and then decline and desertion, in fact, of the four or five places which mm -hmm. we know to the north of Jerusalem. So this is the first piece of evidence which works very well with the assumption of uh, some sort of a territorial entity located there with the hub around the Gibeon. The second piece of information is Hibet Kayafa. I go back here to Hibet Kayafa. We mentioned Hibet Kayafa when we spoke about the united uh, monarchy. Hibet Kayafa, which uh, uh, is now well-known site in the Shefela, uh, in fact, in the Valley of Elah, which is the location of the battle between David and Goliath, fortified site for the 10th century. The excavator associated Hibet Kayafa with Judah and Jerusalem, which is a viable possibility. But there is another possibility that Hibet Kayafa, in fact, is the southwesternmost uh, stronghold of this northern Israelite entity facing the lowlands. And this can be the, reg the reason for the confrontation, in fact, at the Valley of Elah and also for the confrontation with the Pharaoh in the 10th century BC. And then we have another piece of evidence which is uh, really interesting and especially for the two of us. So this is the clue already that I'm going to get back to Megiddo now. <laughs> uh, we have uh, a system of destruction layers in the Jezreel Valley in the 10th century BC. We know very well they are radiocarbon dated. So there's no way to escape from the 10th century and they are not at the same moment. So there is a gradual process of destruction. After the destruction, the next phase features already material culture, which is different from what had been there before and is a forerunner of the material culture of the Northern Kingdom. And at Megiddo, a block was found by the University of Chicago in the 1920s with an inscription of Sheshog the first king of Egypt. So how to understand it? This probably uh, Sheshong uh, came to the Jezreel Valley, was involved one way or the, the other with the transition from Canaanite life until the beginning of the 10th century into this new phase of the Northern Kingdom and established a monument or put an inscription in a building uh, at Megiddo in the second half of the 10th century. You describe a series of destructions in the Jezreel Valley indicating a, a span of time here. And then you bring up the, uh, the Sheshonk stela from Megiddo. So who is responsible for all of these destructions? Is it Sheshonk? Is it somehow related to Saul? 
Good question. The destructions in the valley uh, are connected one way or the other. There is this system of destructions, we spoke about it, and they are in the 10th century and they are gradual. The only way to understand these destructions is, is to see them as uh, um, expansion of the highlanders, let's say the Proto-Israelites, from the highlands into the valley. So from here, there is a short way to link this expansion with, with this speculation about a Saulide uh, territory in the highlands in the 10th century BC. And this should also explain the intervention of Sheshong at Megiddo and placing you know, his uh, monument at Megiddo because uh, expansion of the highlanders into the valley, the breadbasket of ancient Israel on the main highway to the north must have been an annoyance uh, for the goals of the pharaoh in Canaan in the 10th century. And as you're fond of pointing out, even Labayu attacked Megiddo. Right. In previous discussions, we talked about the Shechem Shiloh uh, formation. How does the Saulide entity fit into that story? Very good question, because we, we are dealing here with three territorial formations over a period of time of about one century, that's all. And all of them, one way or the other, connected to the rise of the Northern Kingdom or the rise of a territorial kingdom named Israel. The first one is Shechem Shiloh uh, in the 11th century, destroyed in, in the late uh, 11th century BC, replaced by the territory of Seoul with the center, Hab, at Gibbon in the 10th century, declining in the late 10th century. And then the third one is the Northern Kingdom, which uh, rises in the late 10th century BC. So we need to ask the question of the connection between the three. We don't know the answer for sure. We can speculate that the decline of Shiloh and rise of King Saul were related, and that also the decline of King Saul and the rise of the Northern Kingdom were related. Saul, the murky figure, now has archaeological backing. Can you summarize your argument? I think that uh, uh, the Saul episode in the Bible has some sort of uh, an historical memory in it. I think that uh, uh, we are dealing with attempts of a local ruler in the highlands to exploit a situation in the 10th century. By the way, not from the two traditional centers of power in Jerusalem and Shechem. He rules over much of the territory of the highlands. He tries to expand to the lowlands. Uh, there is archaeological evidence, especially for the core of his territory in the area of Gibeon. And there are several indications archaeological for his attempts to uh, expand, especially to the uh, Jezreel Valley in the north. At the same time, a pharaoh in Egypt, Sheshom I, establishes the 22nd dynasty. And this is the moment when Egypt tries to re-establish its uh, control over the land of Canaan uh, as it used to be in the time of the New Kingdom in the late Bronze Age. And uh, here uh, we get a clash between the expansion of a Highlander ruler, uh, let's say the dynasty of uh, Seoul in the Highlands, and the goals uh, of Sheshong I, uh, king of Egypt. Sheshong comes uh, uh, with the campaign. He goes into the highlands, which is not very usual for an Egyptian uh, campaign. He takes over the center of power of King Saul, and uh, this uh, brings about the decline of uh, the places that we described in the region of Gibeon. He takes over also the Jezreel Valley in the north. He makes Megiddo a center of power in the second half, middle to second half of the 10th century BC. There is a, another question that needs to be asked according to what I have just described. So he comes, uh, Sheshong the first in the 10th century. He takes out the territorial entity of King Saul. How is this connected to the rise of the Northern Kingdom immediately thereafter? And how is this connected or not to the rise 
of the Davidic dynasty in Jerusalem. Okay. Israel, looking forward to the next one? Me too. Okay.